And the final case we're going to consider is the polarizability of a metal. Now, this is where things get much more interesting. So we have in the case of a metal, if we draw it out right here, a bunch of sort of metal ions, which are forming the lattice right here. But the thing is, is that the electrons which are in the metal are, of course, delocalized. So this means that all the electrons in the metallic system, in the metallic structure, are just kind of whizzing around, really. Um, there's no real sort of like predictive like element to where they're going to be, unless you, of course, apply a current or something. Like in the absence of that, they're just kind of whizzing around randomly, essentially. So this is going to obviously significantly alter our formula right here for the polarizability alpha of omega. Now, of course, if we take our formula as we had it before, this system is going to be a little bit different, isn't it? So what we have in the case of a metal is just a bunch of electrons just kind of whizzing around. There's not really any kind of spring restoring force, is there? I mean, there's going to be some kind of force from the ions onto the electrons, but it's not really going to behave in like a spring way, not like an ordered cloud, which we were considering before, where we had our nucleus and our electron cloud kind of behaving like an elastic spring. How is this formula going to change? Well, we find that because there's no restoring force, this omega naught squared term is zero. There is just no restoring force within the system. And so the electrons don't really feel that. So you're actually going to, if you go through and do all the differential equations again, you actually find that there's just, this term just drops out, essentially. Um, the other terms, of course, remain because, of course, there is a damping force with the electric field. And, of course, there is going to be an externalized driving frequency. So with this, we can go ahead and take our relative permittivity formula, which is 1 plus n alpha divided by epsilon 0. We're going to assume that our electrons are fairly spaced apart, which is a valid assumption for most metals. And we're going to go ahead and do what we did before and just substitute in the polarizability. So this is going to be our simplified form for a metal. So let's go ahead and think about what's going to be going on with these electrons. So we have our big metal right here. And for now, we're not going to think about the sort of ions that are forming the lattice. We're just going to think about the electrons. There's going to be an electron right here. Um, when we apply an oscillatory electric field, which is what we're doing, then this electron is sort of just going to go like that. It's just going to oscillate back and forth to some extent. There's, of course, going to be a lot more randomness because it's in three dimensions. But generally, there's going to be a sort of moving back and forth. It's not going to be like a perfect spring because, of course, it's not kind of attached to the atom like it was before. But generally, there will be a kind of back and forth kind of motion like there. But of course, what could very well happen is that this electron could, in fact, collide with another electron. If the other electron is doing the same thing and just so happens to be on the same path as this electron, then it's pretty likely that they will collide. And this is what is happening. And... This, in fact, is what damping physically is on a microscopic level. It's the collision between electrons. And, of course, that collision is not going to be perfectly elastic. It's going to lose some energy. And that is what is causing there to be this kind of damping term right here. And it's going to cause the electrons to lose velocity and therefore work against the driving force of the electric field that's applied externally. Now, what we can do in condensed matter physics is we can often define what is known as the relaxation time tau. Now, tau is basically asking the question of what is the average time across all of the electrons within our system between collisions? So this is the average time between collisions right there. Of course, the actual time between collisions is going to vary from electron to electron because it's pretty random. But you find that you can define an average quantity tau, which is how long you can expect this electron to just go in a straight line before it gets knocked off by another electron that happens to cross paths with it. Now, I'm going to ask the question, what is the momentum of these electrons whilst they're in the metal and they're responding to this electric field right here? 
Well, the momentum is going to be changing in response to the electric field because the electric field is going to be accelerating the electrons and therefore they're going to be gaining momentum. So what I want to know is what is the change in the momentum after a very small time interval dt has elapsed right there. And this is of course of an electron on its path whilst it's not colliding with any other electrons. So we're taking an infinitesimal moment in time. And we're gonna ask ourselves, what is the change in momentum during time window dt? Well, we can write that the momentum at time t plus dt right here, is equal to the momentum at time t plus the force that has acted on the particle over that time window. Because, of course, Newton's second law says that force is the rate of change of momentum. And so, therefore, after a time interval dt, you're going to experience a change in momentum after time interval dt, right here. And what, what is this force? Well, this force is going to just be the electric field strength, minus ee, because, of course, it's an electron, so therefore it's going to be a minus sign. But this will only hold true as long as this electron in our metal is not scattering off other electrons. And what did we say? Well, after an average time of tau, which is known as the scattering time or relaxation time, then the electrons will scatter. The electrons will collide off other electrons and therefore change their momentum. So this will only hold true for that kind of time window. So how do we account for that when trying to describe kind of the overall equation of motion for the electron? Well, we can actually think about this in terms of probabilities. Now, for the most part, the electron is not going to be colliding with other electrons during the time window tau. For every step dt right here, then the pro probability of this time window dt actually being within a collision period is just going to be given by dt divided by tau, because of course that's the overall time window, and this is just the time window that we're considering. So if we even draw this out in terms of like a timeline or something, so say an electron collision happens here and another electron collision happens here, this tau is our kind of total time window right here. And let's say we, you know, have our dt time interval right here. Well, for the most part, we're not likely to kind of intersect at one of these kind of points right here. But it's likely that we could you know, at just random chance, land it over here or over in this period right here. But for the most part, we're not going to do that. So we can say that the probability of scattering is given by dt divided by tau. And so what we can then say is that this equation will hold true for almost all the time. But in order to account for that, we need to multiply this side by 1 minus dt divided by tau right here. And this is the probability that the electron is basically moving in a straight line as per usual and is not scattering. So let's go ahead and write this out. So we're saying that our momentum after time interval dt will almost certainly just be like how it normally is, but it's accounted for by this kind of probability that it's not scattering, because when it is scattering, then this is not going to hold up. And so we have to think a little bit more carefully. So let's go ahead and multiply this out right here. So we're going to get on the right hand side, P of T, the momentum as a function of time of our electron, minus EE times DT. Uh, for that term, then we've got the inner term, which is minus DT divided by tau times the momentum p right here and well we could multiply out this term but as you notice we have a dt here and a dt here so we actually have a term that is dt squared and whenever you see a dt squared or d anything squared it's going to be absolutely tiny and so there's no point in really accounting for it so we're just not going to bother multiplying it out and we're just going to say that it's basically this right here so Okay, that's cool. What's next? Well, we can subtract both sides of this equation by a factor of just p of t right here. So we have p of t plus dt minus p of t. 
equals minus, and we can just put this in brackets, e e plus p of t divided by tau, and then we can just put the dt out the front. And the reason why I've done this is because now we can quite easily divide both sides by dt, and we're going to get on the left-hand side p of t plus dt minus p of t, all divided by dt, is equal to all of this stuff on the right here. So this left-hand side should actually look rather familiar. This is actually the form of a first derivative. This is like the first order approximation, and when dt is very, very small, then this will tend towards uh, dp by dt right here, our rate of change of momentum. So this is going to be equal to minus ee plus p of t over tau. So this is our actual net force that's happening on average on our electron. It's traveling within our system right here. And so we can now say that because this is the net force, we can just simply put this as mx double dot is equal to minus e e. And I'm just going to consider the x direction, assuming this is only being only the electric field is being applied in only the x direction, plus px divided by tau right here. But what did we say mx double dot was before when we were considering our equation of motion for the microscopic oscillator model in the last video? Well, we said that mx double dot was equal to m gamma x dot, which is our damping term, or minus m gamma x dot, because it was acting in the opposite direction, of course, minus e e x, where e was just our electric field. And so something really nice here is going to happen because now we can equate what we had before to this right here, which we've just derived from considering the scattering of an electron. And so we're going to get that minus e e, and oops, there should be a minus sign right here, minus px divided by tau is simply equal to minus m gamma x dot minus e ex. And so we can clearly see that the electric field terms are going to cancel out and these minus times are going to cancel out. And if you notice right here, well, mx dot, that's just mass times velocity, which is, of course, momentum right here. So actually, that's going to cancel out. px is going to cancel out with mx double dot. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with 1 divided by tau is equal to gamma. And that's a really cool result. That actually gives us some physical significance as to what our gamma actually is on a microscopic level. Because, of course, we said that the gamma term was just simply the proportionality factor between the force and the first derivative of displacement on a macroscopic level. This is what we find experimentally true for gamma. But tau actually gives us in terms of the microscopic scattering time, which is super, super useful, as now instead of writing everything in terms of gamma, we can actually write it in terms of something which is a little bit kind of easier to physically conceptualize. So when writing out our equation for the permittivity, epsilon r, as a function of the driving frequency, we can now say that this is equal to 1 plus n e squared over m epsilon naught, and multiplied by our factor that we've been using quite a lot. So 1 divided by minus omega squared. And instead of writing it in terms of gamma, we can actually write it as minus i omega divided by tau right there. Or we can just simply to keep it like a little bit less messy, we can just write it as i tau to the minus 1 times omega right here. And so we can actually take all these minus signs out and then just put it at the front there so it looks a little bit nicer. So there is our permittivity of a metal in terms of the driving frequency and our constants right here, including the density of the electrons and our scattering time right here. Now I'm going to go back to something a lot more simple than what we've been doing and I'm going to reintroduce Ohm's law. And Ohm's law, as hopefully we all know, is just V equals IR. Voltage equals current times resistance. So fairly straightforward stuff. Now I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by 
a distance measure or a length measure. So I'm going to get V divided by L is equal to I times R divided by L right here. But of course, the potential difference per unit length is actually just the electric field. This is what electric field is. It's either force per charge or it's in fact potential difference per distance. And because we're considering a linear system right here, we don't have anything spherical going on, then we can simply say that the potential difference in which we have to accelerate a charge through is simply equal to the electric field times the distance in which you actually want to accelerate that charge through. So that's hopefully, hopefully straightforward stuff. So we're going to just put the E, our electric field, is equal to I R divided by L right here. Now we're going to consider a cross section right here. So I've only drawn like the front panel, but I'm actually going to consider a cross section right here. And this area is going to be of area A right here. Now I'm going to multiply both top and bottom of this side by the area. So I'm doing no harm to the equation. I'm multiplying top and bottom by the same thing. And I'm going to get I r divided by l multiplied by a over a. But hopefully you guys will be familiar with the concept of resistivity, which is often given the symbol rho. Resistivity is basically what happens when we take any dimensional factors outside of resistance. So resistance is just r, but of course the resistance is going to depend on how big and how wide our conductor is. So if we make it wider, then we find that the resistance decreases because there's more of an area for the current to flow through. But if we make it longer, then we find that the current decreases because the resistance increases for a, div a given potential difference. So how do we get this resistivity? Well, if we know that resistance is proportional to the length divided by the area, and we say that this proportionality constant is equal to the resistivity, then we can simply rearrange this equation in order to get that the resistivity is equal to Ra divided by L right here. And as we can see in this equation, we have Ra divided by L. So we can now go ahead and just swap that out for resistivity. So we have I rho divided by A. But what is I divided by A? Well, this is a common quantity that we often give in electromagnetism called current density, which we often give the symbol J. And J is normally a vector, but because we're only considering one dimension, we're just going to consider the current flowing in this direction per unit area. So J for this, for this consideration will be a scalar. So J is defined as I divided by A, or di by dA if you have a area-dependent current, which you can often have. Um, but obviously we're going to assume that the current is uniform across the cross-section. So we're going to get that E is equal to J times rho right here. Now, we have this in terms of resistivity, but we're actually going to transform this into conductivity. Now, because conductance and resistance are opposites, the way in which this manifests mathematically is that the conductivity, which is often given the symbol sigma, is equal to 1 divided by the resistivity. And so conductivity is a dimensionally independent measure of how conductive a material is. So we're just going to get that E is equal to J divided by sigma, and therefore J is equal to sigma times E right here. And because, of course, we're trying to consider vectors as much as possible, we're just going to go ahead and put vectors on these things. So J as a vector is equal to the conductivity, which is a scalar, multiplied by the electric field, which is also a vector quantity. So this is essentially Ohm's law. And in this variant of Ohm's law, it's not only a vector quantity, which is really helpful for our considerations, but it also doesn't matter on the size of whatever conductor we're considering. So it can be any size we want, and this would always hold. So this is really, really useful, and we will probably be using this equation multiple times throughout the coming course. Now, what actually is the current density J? Well, J is, of course, as we just said, given by the current divided by the area. And for now, we're just going to consider it as a scalar. But what is the current? Well, the current is the 
rate of change of charge. So we can also write this as one divided by the area times delta Q divided by delta T right here. But how far will our, a given electron, which is being accelerated in a certain direction, so the X direction, how far will that electron get in this time delta T right here? Well, it's just gonna make a distance delta X right here, which is equal to its velocity multiplied by delta T. And remember this velocity could be changing as a function of time if it's accelerating, but speed equals this distance, which could be changing times delta T right here. So we can rearrange this to say that delta T is equal to delta X divided by V. And plugging this into this above equation right here, we get one divided by A times delta Q, which is our charge, divided by delta T, but of course delta T is delta X, divided by V and the V comes on top, so we just get V right here. But what is our change in charge? Well, our change in charge is simply the number of electrons that pass a certain point per second, so I'm just gonna call that NE for now, multiplied by the charge on the individual electron right here. And that's gonna be the total amount of charge passing any given point per second. So we're gonna get NE times V, all divided by A delta X right here. But what is A delta X? Well, the area has units of length squared and delta X has units of length. So we're gonna get a length cubed term on the bottom of this equation right here. So if we think about our area right here along our conductor, Delta X is gonna be along here and our area is gonna be the cross-sectional area of our conductor right here. So they will always be parallel. And so we're gonna get a volume of size dV or delta V right here. So we're gonna get NE times EV divided by delta volume. So just to clarify that this, veloc this is velocity, small v, and this is volume, big V. But what is any divided by V, delta V? Well, that is just our electron density. So the number of electrons per unit volume, N, which we've been using all along. So this will be just N times our charge on our electron multiplied by our velocity. So we've related the current to the velocity essentially like that, with only one alteration is that because obviously it's a negative charge, there should have been a minus sign, which I should have introduced a little bit further up, but that's fine right there. And just to use proper notation, J is of course a vector, and therefore we can say that this is minus NE times the velocity vector right here. And this velocity is sometimes referred to as the drift velocity of the electrons. So now we can equate this J right here with our Ohm's law version of J right here. So we can now equate that sigma times our electric field is equal to minus NE times our drift velocity right here. So what this is basically saying is that at steady state, the electrons will be drifting with a constant current density J, which arises due to the fact that they are drifting at constant velocity. So if the velocity increases, then this charge hitting a unit area per unit second will increase right here. But what about a steady state? Well, a steady state, then we have that mx double dot is equal to zero. And therefore, if we go back to our equation that we had previously, we find that minus e times e is equal to our momentum divided by tau right here. So this is what we had previously. Well, p is just mv, so we can just write that as mv divided by tau. And so we get that the velocity is equal to minus EE times tau divided by the mass right here. So that will give us our drift velocity of any electron within an electric field causing a current to flow. But let's go ahead and substitute this into this equation we have right here, because now that we know the velocity, we can now use relate this to our conductivity sigma. So we're gonna get that sigma times E is equal to minus, and we're gonna get another minus from here, which is gonna cancel, 
So we're going to get e times n, which should have been there, and we're going to get a squared, because we have a factor of e here and a factor of e here, times tau divided by m multiplied by e. And now we can just cancel out these e's right here, and we get this result that sigma is equal to n e squared times tau divided by m. So this relates the conductivity of a metal to the scattering time, the electron density, and the constants, of course, which are the charge of the electron and the mass. Now, <clears throat> I should just clarify at this point that this is what's known as the Drude model, and is actually not technically true for a lot of metals. And in fact, you actually have to go to the Summerfield model for how this, how this corrects it which I will actually be doing a video on later down the line. Um, if you want a little bit more detail into the quantum mechanical effects that they have on metals, then I have a video talking all about the Fermi gas and the Summerfield model talking about this. But this is the classical model of conductivity, and it relates the conductivity sigma to all of these factors right here. So now we've done all this hard work, we can simply write that the permittivity is equal to, it before it was equal to 1 minus n e squared divided by m epsilon naught times 1 over i omega tau to the minus 1 plus omega squared. So this is what we had before. But of course, n e squared over m epsilon naught well, we can actually rearrange this to get that sigma divided by tau is equal to n e squared divided by m. And so if we substitute that into our permittivity formula, we get 1 minus sigma divided by tau epsilon naught times 1 divided by i omega tau to the minus 1 plus omega squared. And now what we can finally do is we can just pull this factor of tau within here just to make it look a little bit neater. So we're going to get this is equal to 1 minus sigma over epsilon naught times i omega plus tau omega squared right here. So I'll just pull this tau in right there. And there we have it. This is our frequency dependent permittivity for metals. And this was what the Drude model will predict as to how the permittivity will change dependent on frequency. And, of and oftentimes this sigma will often be given the subscript sigma naught because of course this is the conductivity when there is no oscillatory electric field being applied. This conductivity is just the standard conductivity when there is a DC current applied. This is what we wanted. It was the permittivity as a function of the frequency. So what is it we love to do after deriving a formula? Well, we love to see what happens in the frequency limits in order to predict what the behaviour is going to be like at these extreme frequency limits for metals. So what are our kind of things we're comparing to? Well, let's go ahead and have a look at what's going to happen in the low frequency limit. So what do I mean by the low frequency limit? Well, I mean that omega is going to be much, much less than 1 divided by tau, which of course we said was gamma before, but this is our kind of thing we're comparing it to, if the frequency is much less than the inverse of the scattering time. So what does that kind of give us? Well, that gives us that omega tau is much, much less than 1. Now, I'm going to rearrange this equation slightly, just so we have omega tau as kind of our parameter that we're comparing it to. So now we have omega tau as a sort of, as a term, which we can now see is going to be compared to 1 quite nice and easily. So if, in this case, omega tau is much, much less than 1, then what do we normally say? Well, this term is kind of insignificant in comparison to this term. So therefore, we can approximate this formula as 1 minus sigma naught divided by i omega epsilon naught right here. And then I can just simply put the i on the top of the fraction by just changing the sign right here, because of course, minus 1 over i is just simply equal to i. So I'm just going to get 1 plus i sigma naught 
divided by epsilon naught times omega right here. And now that we have the permittivity, we can just go ahead and simplify this into the refractive index by taking the square root as we did before. Now, typically for a metal at room temperature, you can actually ignore this one term right here. Um, it doesn't actually make that much of a difference. And so this permittivity is going to be a lot bigger than one. And the reason for that, you can kind of understand, is that you obviously can't see through metals. So they're obviously going to have a very, 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 very high permittivity. Obviously, you can't send an electric field through a metal very easily because it just completely cancels out. So you can actually say that at room temperature, there's not really any difference in adding one to it or not. The permittivity is complex and it will be equal to sigma naught divided by epsilon naught omega in magnitude, and it will be complex right there. So now we can go ahead and get the refractive index, which of course we said was equal to the square root of the relative permittivity. And so when we square root this, we can just get that I sigma naught divided by epsilon naught omega right here. And I can actually manipulate this expression a little bit right here in order to separate this n term in terms of a real and a complex component. So what are we going to get? Well, let's just take all the stuff that's not complex out the front. So we're going to get sigma naught divided by epsilon naught omega. And we've got the square root of i right here. So what is the square root of i? Well, dealing with complex numbers, it's often very handy to treat them in terms of polar coordinates. Now it was Euler who said that e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine times theta right here. Now what happens when we're completely at on the imaginary axis right here and there is no real component? At what angle will this happen? Well we know that cos of 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians is zero. So if we insert e to the i pi over 2, we get that that is equal to cos of pi over 2, which of course we said is 0, plus i sine pi over 2, which of course is just 1. Sine of 90 degrees is just 1. So this actually simplifies to e to the i pi over 2 is equal to i. So we can actually express the complex number i in terms of polar coordinates, which is actually really useful for what we're trying to do, because this square root of i is, we want to express this in terms of a real and an imaginary number. And so instead of writing root i, we can actually write that this is equal to all this stuff out the front times the square root of e to the i pi over 2. But of course, we can just write square root as a power of a half. And so using the law of exponentials, this is just going to simplify to this. So now we've actually got this root i in terms of a polar exponential. Then we can, in fact, use this identity again in order to get it back into just a real and an imaginary component. But this time we're going to use pi over 4 as our angle. So we're going to get that e to the i pi over 4 this time is equal to cos of pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4. And when you work out cos of pi over 4 and indeed sine of pi over 4, you actually get 1 over root 2 right there. So it's 45 degrees is the same as pi over 4 radians. And when you get cos and sine of both 45 degrees, you get 1 divided by the square root of 2. So we can say that this is equal to 1 over root 2 into brackets of 1 plus i right here. So we can now substitute this into our refractive index formula to get that right here. So we have this rather peculiar result right here. We have this refractive index that is complex. It's got a complex number right here in i. Now, before, what did we say about our wave vector k? Well, we said that k, our wave vector, is equal to the refractive index multiplied by our free space wave vector k0, which was just omega divided by c, and this was just the wave vector the light would travel in a vacuum. 
But what if n isn't real? What, how is this going to affect our propagating wave? If we have our wave travelling, then at a snapshot in time, then we can essentially describe the electric field as being e naught times some amplitude times e to the i kx. There is, of course, going to be an omega t right here as well. But we can say that for an electromagnetic wave that just happens to be passing through a material, then in a snapshot in time, it's given as this right here. But we can substitute this in for, instead of just writing k, we can write this is equal to n k naught. So we have i times n k naught times x right here. This is our propagating electric field, which is of course equal to e naught e to the i n omega x divided by c right here. But something very interesting happens when we substitute in our complex refractive index right here. What are we going to get? Well, let's go ahead and do it. So we're going to get that this is e naught, just our amplitude right here, times e to the i. Now we have an omega over c right here. So omega over c. And for n, I'm just going to write in all of our stuff that we got. So sigma naught over 2 epsilon naught omega into 1 plus i times x right here. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the exponent right there. But as you can see, we have two terms right here because, of course, we have a 1 plus i, which is actually going to lead to two different terms. So if we keep on rearranging this and expanding out the brackets, then we get this. But as you can see, something quite interesting is going to happen. We have the i from our propagating wave that we had before, but we have this cancelling with the i that we had from the refractive index. So we actually get two i's cancelling to cause a minus one. So that's just going to become a minus sign right here. And as you can see, we now have e to the power of something minus something else, which means we can separate out these exponentials. So we're going to have e naught times e to the i omega over c root sigma over 2 epsilon naught times x, which is our complex term. But we're also going to have an e to the minus omega over c root sigma over 2 epsilon naught omega times x right here. And as you notice that this component of our electric field that's propagating through our material this is not complex. This is a real exponential. And this is very, very important because what this is telling us is that our electric field will essentially just decrease or the amplitude will just decrease with distance. And this kind of lines up with almost what you'd expect to find in a metal, because when we said before no electric field can pass through a metal, well, that wasn't quite true because we've actually just shown that there is an exponential fall off. So if we have our electromagnetic wave and then it hits this metal surface, well, it won't quite go to zero instantaneously. There will actually be a kind of fall off, but of course it will just go to zero pretty quickly. So there's going to be a kind of distance right here between the edge of the metal to where the electric field is kind of essentially zero or very, very small. And we actually define what's known as the skin depth delta as being equal to this constant right here. So it's the characteristic length that will show you how thick you need to pass through the metal in order for the electric field of a propagating wave to die off. And essentially that is going to be equal to root 2 epsilon naught c divided by sigma naught omega. So we have the skin depth term that's just kind of popped out because the metal, the propagating radiation has essentially just fallen very, very low. And this is kind of like the distance at which it's fallen to sort of around 37% or a factor of 1 over e of its original value outside here. But because of this fact that the refractive index of a metal was complex, that was the key reason as to why no electric waves can travel through the metal. Because of course the metal has so many electrons and the electrons just essentially move out the way so as to 
cancel out any electric field. And that's why you can't have an electric field propagating through a metal. And the distance at which it falls off is given by this delta skin depth term right here. So all that was the case for very, very low frequencies. So we had to make the assumption that the angular frequency was much less than the inverse of the scattering time. But what about the other possibility? What if omega tau is much, much greater than one? Well, what's going to happen right here? Well, if we write out our relative permittivity in the form in which it's a little bit more useful to make this comparison, we get it looking a little bit like this right here. So now omega tau is really big, then it's going to be a lot greater than one right here. So this one term is essentially going to become insignificant because it's very, very small. And therefore, like we did before, we can say that this is approximately equal to one minus sigma naught and we're going to get i omega epsilon naught in the denominator. But because this one term is really small, we're just going to get minus i omega tau. And of course, we can now see that these two minus signs right here is just going to become a plus. And so we can get rid of this minus sign right there. But of course, we have a i times i, which is a minus one, which will change it back into a minus sign. So a few steps I kind of did all in one go right there, but it's just kind of algebra. And these two omegas are then going to combine to make an omega squared right here. So we have that our permittivity as a function of frequency is equal to one minus sigma naught divided by omega squared epsilon naught tau. But of course, we know that sigma naught, our DC conductivity, is equal to n e squared tau over m. And so we can put this in terms of sigma and say that the relative permittivity is equal to 1 minus n e squared tau divided by m omega squared epsilon naught tau right there. So substituting in for sigma. So the taus are going to cancel out right here. And we're going to find that this rearranges to 1 minus n e squared over m epsilon naught. And I'm just going to keep this term as it is right there. And we're going to get 1 divided by omega squared. Now, because we have a 1 over omega squared in the denominator right here, then it must follow that this term right here must have units of omega squared right here. Because, of course, we have to have it equaling the same dimensionality as both epsilon r and 1, which is, of course, dimensionless. And so therefore, the dimensions must cancel out. And so therefore, this term right here, this n e squared over m epsilon naught, must have dimensions of angular frequency. And so we define this omega p, and I'll reveal what the p is very, very soon, as being equal to the square root of n e squared over m epsilon naught right here. And therefore, we can just essentially write the relative permittivity as being equal to 1 minus omega p squared divided by omega squared right here. So what's going to happen if the driving frequency omega is below omega p right here? then what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get 1 minus a term. And because this is less than this term, then this overall fraction is going to be greater than 1. So we're going to have 1 minus a number greater than 1. So therefore, we're going to find that epsilon r is less than 0. And what does that tell us? Well, if the relative permittivity is less than 0, and the permittivity is negative, then that must mean that if the permittivity is negative and the refractive index is equal to the square root of the permittivity, then the refractive index is complex. And what did we say about complex refractive indices before? Well, we said that that leads to any electromagnetic waves just decaying within the metal right here. So any incident wave that's coming along to a metal as soon as it hits the metal, and the metal has obviously a complex refractive index, then it's just going to sort of die out at around about this skin depth of delta right here. So this is kind of what we were saying before. But what happens when omega 
right here is above this omega p, then we get epsilon r is equal to 1 minus, and now this is going to be a number that is between 0 and 1 right here. So epsilon r is, in fact, greater than 0. So if epsilon r is greater than 0, that must mean that n is now real and is no longer complex. And if you have n being real, well, that equates to essentially an electromagnetic wave just traveling through some kind of dielectric, because of course the dielectric is what causes the refractive index to go up, or the permittivity to go up for that matter, and therefore the refractive index. But if you have a real refractive index, then you can essentially have a wave passing through. But we're considering a metal. How is this possible? We have a metal and we're now saying that a wave can pass through the metal. This is what we were expecting before, but this wave can now pass through a metal. So the metal is no longer opaque. And so we now have a situation where the metal has essentially become a dielectric because of course N is now real, which means that you can actually get waves going through. It's no longer complex and having this kind of really rapid decay right there. So the metal becomes a dielectric and, you know, rather than it just sort of stopping, if we have our wave right here, it essentially just phase shifts because a refractive index just causes a phase shift. It might get a little bit lower in amplitude, but it will still propagate periodically. It won't be a decay, much like the case we had before. And now I can finally reveal what this omega p is. This is known as the plasma frequency of the metal right there. And what it's saying is that when you have a driving frequency, if you drive this metal so fast that it exceeds this omega p, then this metal essentially becomes a dielectric. And so you can therefore pass electromagnetic waves through the metal as if it was just made of rubber or some kind of dielectric right there. And so what's physically happening is that these electrons are driven so fast, like back and forth, that essentially they can't keep up and they're not able to counteract any electromagnetic waves that pass through. They just cannot keep up with the driving electric field, with the driving frequency. And so because of that, they just behave like a dielectric. And so this is actually forms the basis of plasmonics and is one of like the most kind of fundamental things. And so you can end up with a thing called a plasmon traveling through. And maybe one day I'll make a video about that topic in particular. So thanks a lot for watching this video. I appreciate it was a very long one, but that'll probably be the last video that I do on the electric response within materials. And next up, we'll be having a look at magnetism. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope that was really useful. And I'll see you guys in the next video.